Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome everyone. We appreciate your presence. We welcome our visitors. It's always good to assemble in the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. So it's good to see you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We hope in doing the next hour we can be an inspiration to you. I'm sure what Paul has lined up for us and where music today will be a blessing to our hearts. And so now we'll turn the service over to him and he'll direct the song service. And I trust to be a blessing to everyone. So Paul at this time. Get your hymn on turn the page 181. Blessed Assurance. sing a song now entitled City of Gold.
take your Bibles today and turn, will you please, to the Songs of Solomon. The Songs of Solomon. I'll give you the page number. The page number in the original Schofield Reference Bible is page 707. The Songs of Solomon, chapter 4. If you don't have the original Schofield Bible, you'll find the book of Psalms and turn back to your right. you come to the book of Proverbs and then the book of Ecclesiastes and then the Song of Solomon. Chapter 4. In this great chapter, we find here the bridegroom speaking to the bride and then the bride speaking back to the bridegroom. It's a picture of a man and his wife. It's a picture of Christ and the church. Now I want to begin reading with verse 1. Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse 1, page 707. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as the flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shown, which came up from the washing, whereof every one bears twins, and none is barren among them. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet. Thy speech is commonly. Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. Thy neck is like the tower of David built for an armory, whereupon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Thy two breasts are like two young roes that are twins, which feed among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I'll get me to the mountains of mirth and to the hill of frankincense. Thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. Now I want to drop down to verse 16 and we find the bride answering back to the bridegroom. Now here in this chapter you find Lebanon mentioned many times. Lebanon at one time was one of the most beautiful pieces of land over in the Middle East. One of the most beautiful nations in the Middle East until the terrorists and war and the pillow and all of that crowd came in there and destroyed the beautiful land of Lebanon. It was a land of beautiful fig trees. Very, very beautiful indeed. It would be a long time before it will ever be beautiful again. They've got to stop all that fighting and let the trees grow back again before it will ever be beautiful like beautiful Lebanon in years gone by. And so Lebanon is mentioned here in uh, chapter 4. But look at verse 16. O wake, awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let thy beloved come into his garden, and eat his pleasant fruits. I want to speak to you this morning on this line of thought. Come wind, and blow upon my garden. Now here a garden is likened to a man's soul. Now you must remember the garden of the Lord. You know, God first started man out in a garden. Gardens are very beautiful when they're kept as they should be. One of the most beautiful gardens I've seen is the garden near the garden tomb where Jesus was buried. Right there at the foot of Mount Calvary, there's a beautiful garden. Right near the garden tomb. Very beautiful. And so here he's talking about a garden which is like a man's soul. God speaks about our soul being a garden and then, of course, the blessings of God coming upon us and God using us. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 12, and their soul should be as a watered garden. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, you are God's husbandry. So we see here that God likens man's soul as to a beautiful garden that can be a blessing in many ways to those with whom he come in contact with. And God wants us to be a blessing. God likes to come down in the garden of our hearts and dwell in our hearts in sweet communion and fellowship. A garden is very beautiful. And of course, while you have flowers, as a beautiful fragrance coming from those flowers. I like to smell them. My wife has some sweet shrubs and other flowers around our house. And at different times when they're in bloom and, and the, the fragrance come into the house and through the window and as you go out in the yard, I just love to smell those beautiful flowers, and I know you do likewise. 
There's something about it that's very helpful. And God wants a man's soul, a man's personality, a man's service to be a blessing to those around him. And you can. God wants us to realize that we're likened to a garden. And if you care for that garden like you should, then it can be used to be a great help and a great blessing as you work around others, as you fellowship with others, as you come into contact with others. Now I want to talk about these winds today. It says, come wind and blow upon my garden. And then I want you to notice the, the purpose of the winds. Now God did not send the winds or create the winds for nothing. They are created for a purpose. And he tells us in the Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 13, The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. And then he tells us in chapter 4 and verse 16 of the Songs of Solomon, Awake, O north wind, come, thou south, blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Now what he's saying here is, unless the wind blows upon the garden, the spices, the fragrance will not flow out from that garden. I want us to apply that to our hearts and lives today. Would you like to be a blessing? Would you like to have people say it's good to be around that person? Can you be such a Christian that when you're around someone and they can say, you know, I've been helped. I've been uplifted. I've been blessed today. God wants you to be that kind of garden. In Psalms 135 and verse 7, he said, bring the wind out of his treasures. God brings the wind out of his treasures to blow upon our gardens, upon our souls, upon our personal beings, that we might be a blessing. Now we know the wind blows where it willeth, the Bible tells us. We need to pray for the wind to blow, the Spirit of God to come. Now the wind in the Bible is symbolic of the Spirit of God. In John chapter 3 and verse 8, the Bible said the wind bloweth where it listeth. Now we know without the Spirit of God, without the wind of God blowing upon that sinner, he'll never be saved. Because it's the Spirit of God that comes upon him and convicts him of his lost condition. Without the wind of God upon our lives, we'll never be a blessing. There's a lot of people backslide on God and sour up on the world. And they walk around with a bilious attitude, a due expression on their faces and way they act, people would say, well, if that person is saved, if he's a Christian, I don't want what he's got. I'm miserable enough like I am, and I most certainly would want what he had. We should be a different people, a people that could be a blessing. And when the wind of God blows upon that sinner, like in John chapter 3, while well, Jesus said to Nicodemus, the wind bloweth where it listeth. Now here's the sound thereof. Can I tell you whence it cometh and whither it goeth? So does the Spirit of God move upon that man, that lost person. And it's the Spirit of God that quickens him and makes him alive in Christ Jesus. And then the wind of God, which is symbolic of the Spirit of God, doesn't cease operating there when he gives birth to the soul. He begins to blow and move upon God's people. And the more you're controlled by the Spirit of God or the wind of God, the greater blessing you'll be. Now the Spirit of God gives strength. I recall as a little country boy working out in the farm, maybe have some good water to drink or a bite to eat, and, and then we'd take off the old straw hat and perspiration running down our faces, and then there would come that cool breeze. We would just sit there and enjoy the breeze blowing up on us. And after sitting there relaxing for a few moments, then we felt real good, invigorating. We could go out and there start all over again and maybe continue on until time to go for lunch or time to go in for uh, the evening. But that wind would help us on a hot, salty day when the wind is not blowing, when the sun is real hot and you can feel no breeze, no air. Some of you experienced that last week, no doubt, and they're real hot. But when a good breeze comes along, it makes all the difference in the world. The wind is encouraging, of course. You people are out on the sea, depending upon the wind for their sailboats. Unless a breeze come along, then of course the old boat will just remain still and they are kind of drift along. But when the breeze comes, then the boat begins to sail. You have a lot of Christians like that today. They're just sitting out there on the sea of time and they're doing nothing. 
because the wind is not blowing upon them. The Spirit of God is not coming upon them. He would, he wants to, but they won't invite him. They won't let him. They won't permit him to do so. And a lot of Christians become stale in that respect. The old people that used to grind the, the food, the flour, many years ago by the old windmill. Many times the air becomes steel and the old windmill would not turn. And the people would bring the grain in for miles around and, and then they began to pile up and there were a number of people that were waiting for the wind to blow. And then all of a sudden God would send that good breeze and that old windmill would start turning and people would get on their feet and say, get your grain, get busy. Let's get the grinding done here while the wind is turning the windmill. And they would go and get their grain ground and be able to go back home. You have a lot of church members like that today. They're sitting around and the windmill is not turning. It would turn. God wants to turn it, but they won't let it. They won't permit it. They have themselves in the way and the wind cannot blow upon the windmill. Now today, in the few minutes I have left, I want to talk about the east wind, the north wind, the south wind, the west wind, and the whirlwind. I'll have to move along quite fast in order to do that. Now let's mention the east wind. There's an old aphorism that says when the wind is from the east, it is good for neither man or beast. Also, when the wind is from the east, the fish bite least. Have you ever heard that one? Well, there's a lot of truth to that. When the wind is from the east, many times there's trouble. It doesn't make people feel good. Many times you have east wind in the wintertime, blowing rain from the east. It may last three or four days, even when you don't need it. And some would say when the wind changes and gets out of the east, then it'll stop raining. In Ezekiel chapter 27 and verse 26, Thy roars have brought thee into great waters. The east wind hath broken thee in the midst of the seas. There's a lot of church members today that's been broken by the east wind. You don't have to remain in the east wind. It may come, but it don't, we won't be there forever. Jonah had trouble with the east wind. In Jonah chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible said it came to pass when the sun did rise, that God prepared of him the east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted, and wished himself to die, and said, It's better for me to die than live. Poor old Jonah sitting up there beside that mountain, and there the east wind uh, blowing against him, and he becomes so miserable he wanted to die. Now, when you get in a condition like that, what's happening to you is the east wind is blowing up on you. There's a lot of church members today discouraged and despondent. You've given up. You don't care. Things are happening to you that you don't appreciate. And you know why? The east wind is blowing up on you. If you be faithful to God and look to God and ask God to help you, God can change that wind. We find in Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 17, I will scatter them as with the east wind before the enemy. The Bible says the way of the east wind in 2 Corinthians 1, 4, who comforted us in all our tribulation, we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble. And by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are confident of God. Now what I'm trying to say is this. Many times God will permit the east wind to blow upon you. That's a time when everything seems to go wrong and nothing goes right. And it seems like everything you try to do just falls to pieces. It seems like you put your money in a bag with a hole in it. Nothing works out well. Now what's happening there? The east wind is blowing up on you. And God may permit you sometimes to suffer that for a period of time that you might be able to help others who are under the east wind. In Genesis chapter 41, we find there the east wind speaks of seven years of famine. Pharaoh had a dream and the east wind blew upon the corn and it withered. And that was symbolic of a terrible famine coming into the land of Israel and it did. The east wind doesn't bring good news. You must remember that. And so it speaks of the famine in Genesis chapter 41. The east wind brought locusts up on Egypt, Exodus chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. It was the east wind that covered Egypt with all those locusts that caused Pharaoh and his people a lot of heartache. So when you're having problems, the child of God is the east wind, as it were. Now you remember that. Job had a hard road to hoe when the east wind came in and destroyed his family. And all those terrible things happened to him, blew down his houses and, and killed his uh, cattle and so forth. Poor old Job had a hard road to hoe because God was lying the devils in the east wind in his direction. And that east wind was causing him problems and a lot of trouble. 
Now he stayed the rough wind in the days of the east wind, he tells us in Isaiah 27, 8. Now what is meant by that in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 8, God stayed the rough wind in the day of the east wind. Now what he's telling us here, God is not going to put more on us than we can bear. He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 through 13, that he will not allow you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with that temptation make a way of escape. God is not going to allow his children to be tempted and tested and tried and punished above they're able to bear. God's grace is sufficient. The apostle Paul ran in the east wind when the, he had the thorn in the flesh, but God's grace was sufficient. So there goes the east wind. Something about it is kind of poison like, something we don't like about it. But every child of God many times have to sit through the east wind. God may permit you to do that, that you might help somebody else down the road when they're sitting under the east wind. Now let's move to the north wind. It mentions the north wind in the Song of Solomon 4, 16. Awake, O north wind, come blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Now the north wind is the cool wind. But many times that cool wind will make you feel alone. Has there ever been a time in your life when you felt so lonely? Nobody seemed to care for you. It seemed like you didn't have a friend in the world. I heard a preacher the other night, Dr. Stenhorn, out here at Calvary. I went out to hear him. Great man of God. He was in charge of the preacher boys at Bob Jones for many, many years. A full-time evangelist now out from Bob Jones University. And he made this statement. He said, a man of God, a preacher today that preaches the whole counsel of God without fear or favor and doesn't compromise is a lonely man. Many times he has to live a lonely life. He doesn't have too many people coming around and saying, Preacher, good to see you today. Usually it's a lonely life. And he said, the man of God that stands for the truth lives a lonely life. And I guess the most loneliest man in the world today is the man of God that's standing for the truth of God and not compromising in that respect. And that's the north wind. You may feel lonely. Jacob was left alone in Genesis chapter 32 and verse 24. And all night long he wrestled there with an angel from heaven. He was a lonely man. Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 14 was left alone. He was a real lonely man of God. The north wind was blowing in his direction. Daniel was left alone. He was a lone man in Babylon and fought a, a terrible battle there for God. He was a lonely man. Now, the north wind can be cool when the heat is too hot, uh, too, too hot of course, but uh, just to get alone with God and, and look to God many times, God can cool us with the north wind when the heat gets real hot upon us, so to speak. But that north wind is a lonely wind. And there'll be times in your life as a Christian, if you live the right kind of life, when you're going to spend some lonely days on this earth. That's a time when you need to get along with God. That's a time when you feel like all your friends have let you down. Nobody cares for you anymore. They're unconcerned about you. And they live a lonely life. The north wind is blowing at that particular time. And every child of God must face it. As you grow older, you're going to face it more and more living under the north wind. Many of a dear old man of God and dear Christian today that one time greatly used and blessed of God, but when they got old and Maybe disabled to carry on like they once did. Seem like everybody forgot about them. And they sit around just waiting for God to take them on. Lonely, yes, the north wind is blowing. Then there comes the south wind. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16, it said, Come thou south. Now the south wind melts the ice. We find in Job, chapter 37, verses 16 and 17, Dost thou know the bounce of the clouds, the wondrous work of him which is perfect in knowledge, how thy garments are worn when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. That south wind can bring us together. That south wind can melt the ice. That south wind can melt the differences between individuals. If you let the south wind blow upon you, it can solve a lot of problems. There's many times whenever there's a difference come between you and your friends, or you and your family, or you and your companion, or you and your children, are you and the people you work with, you and your neighbors, a difference can come there. The only thing that can solve that really is the south wind. The south wind of God can melt that difference and bring you together. 
and bring you in close fellowship with each other and in love one for another. In Acts chapter 27 and verse 13, it said, And the south wind blew softly. God knows how to send the south wind to kind of melt out things that shouldn't be in your life, and it blows softly. It's welcome. It'll help you. It'll solve the minutest little problem that you might have in your life. That south wind can be valuable if you let it blow upon you. Would you like to have the little icicles that's forming in your life be melted and once again have that mutual love and fellowship and concern and communion? That can come, but you must let the south wind take care of that. If not, those little icicles are going to tend to build up and they'll become a great wall between you and your family, your children or whatnot. And, and that great wall could cause you a lot of problems. Let the south wind come. In Psalms chapter 7, 8 and verse 26, he caused the east wind to blow in the heaven, and by his power he brought in the south wind. Now you go through the east wind, you face the north wind, there's a time for that south wind. And I'm glad that the south wind comes occasionally. The north wind doesn't blow all the time. The east wind doesn't blow all the time. There comes a time when God sends the south wind. Be patient. Wait on God. And God will send the south wind and melt those things that hinder you that's between you and God. Then number six, there is the west wind. Now that west wind is a wonderful, important wind. I'll tell you why. It's the west wind that brings the cloud and the rains. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42, we find there that Elijah, after having a showdown on Mount Carmel, he sends his servant to go look toward the Mediterranean Sea. Now Mount Carmel, of course, and facing Mount, the Mediterranean Sea from Mount Carmel, you look direct west. And so he went up on top of that mountain on the tip top of it, and I've seen the mountain many times. It's right very near the, the Mediterranean Sea. And Elijah said, you go and see if you see any sign of rain coming. And then he went seven times before he spotted a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. And that west wind was bringing that cloud toward Mount Carmel. And a hand has five fingers, four fingers of thumb, and five is the number of grace. And he came back to Elijah the prophet and said, I see a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. Elijah said, buddy, you better get moving. That's coming to Gullawasha. It hadn't rained in three and a half years. And that west wind brought that little cloud closer and closer and closer. And the closer it came to Mount Carmel, the bigger it became, of course. And the west wind brought the rain they needed. It hadn't rained in three and a half years. And there came a real old-time flood and gully washer. And so the west wind brings blessings and refreshings. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1, As you, the Lord, rain in the time of latter rain, so the Lord will, might, might bring clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. Yes, we need the west wind. It brings blessings. Blessings of the Spirit of God. Many of God's children today sit out there on the north wind, the east wind, and even the south wind, and still not enjoy the blessings of the Holy Spirit of God that God wants you to have. In Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3, I'll pour water upon him that's thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessings upon thine offspring. God wants to send you a gully washer. God wants to send you a flood. God wants to send you showers of blessings. But the west wind must bring them. And before the west wind will come blowing in your direction, you must get in line for it. You must be ready for it. And then God can send the floods upon your dry grounds. We find it was the west wind that carried the locusts out of Egypt. The east wind blew them in. But in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 19, the west wind blew them out. And so whatever trouble and problem the east wind may bring you, lay low before God, be patient, look to God, and that west wind one day will blow that locust right back out in the sea from whence they came. Oh, you say, preacher, I've been on the east wind now so long. Well, just be patient. The same east wind that blew those locusts in on you can blow them back. The west wind can come in and blow them back out again. And that'll happen if you be patient and wait on God. So the west wind carried the locusts into Egypt. The north wind drives away rain, according to Proverbs 25, verse 23. But the west wind brings it in. So what we need as God's people is the rain, the flood, the gully washer, 
the blessing of God, the power of God's Spirit. And uh, rain in the Bible is symbolic of, the Spirit of God is symbolic of blessings from God. And God wants us to be blessed and helped and strengthened. The west wind brings in these showers of blessings and they flood our souls. And then the final one I want to mention is the whirlwind. The whirlwind are made up of all four winds coming together. When you see a whirlwind, you have the north, south, east, and west wind. They all meet together and they begin to whirl. Now occasionally God sends that whirlwind. But the whirlwind is the one that carried Elijah to heaven. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11, Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. The whirlwind will give life for the sinner. If that sinner wants to be saved, then we find the whirlwind can give life to him. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 9 and 10, Thus saith the Lord God come from the four winds. O breath, breathe upon these as slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came unto them, and they lived and stood upon their feet. He's talking here about the nation of Israel. Those bones being brought together. And one of these days the whirlwind is going to put life in those bones. Yes, we thank God for the winds. If you're lost, the wind of God's Spirit can do something for you. If you're saved, the wind of God's blessings can do much for you. Come, O wind, and blow upon my garden. The only way you're going to be a blessing is for the wind of God to blow out from your life fragrance, Christianity, love that will extend out to others along the way. Just pray, God, come, O wind, blow upon my garden and make me a blessing along life's way. Would you like to be a blessing? You can. God wants you to be. And you can be. Stand to your feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that the great wind of God will blow upon our gardens and make us a blessing. God, I pray that you blow upon Northside and make this church a blessing. Blow upon thy children and make them a blessing. O oh, Spirit of God, move upon that sinner and bring him under conviction and quicken him and make him alive. Have your way, our Father, in this invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, while Debbie plays on the organ, if you're here without God, backslidden, and you want to join the church, you want to come forward for any reason, you may respond doing the invitation while she plays. How about it right now? Why wait? <laughs> God is speaking to you. If you need to come forward for any reason, you may come. How about it while we wait?